It's no secret that Pantheon Rise of the Fallen has been on the radar of MMO fans for a long time now, but despite being in the public eye, there still seems to be a lot of mystery about its current state and exactly how it got to where it is. Until now. As with anything else, when talking about Pantheon's development, it's important to have a thorough understanding of the context. And not only is there a lot of context, but it's not always easy to find. I've been following the game closely since 2016, but I've still had to do a lot of research to see the whole picture. And I'd like to thank my friend Raiden who helped me fact check this video, as he is one of the game's original day one supporters and has been tracking it ever since. And I'll cite my sources as I go if you want to dig deeper on your own. So join me as we go all the way back to the beginning. In September 2013, Fission Realms was founded by video game industry veteran Brad McQuaid, along with nine of his friends and colleagues from previous games. Their mission was to go against the grain of the genre and create an intensely challenging and social MMORPG called Pantheon Rise of the Fallen. But they had almost no money. So needless to say, they needed to acquire some, and there were a couple of different options to go about this. Brad McQuaid's previous game, Vanguard Saga of Heroes, suffered a cripplingly buggy launch because, according to him, its publishers pushed the developers to release the game before it was really ready. This was still fresh in Brad's memory, and he was determined to not let it happen again. Even though seeking full funding from a publisher right off the bat is the traditional and more familiar method of MMO development, he didn't want to risk landing in that same situation again, being pressured to make decisions he didn't want to make and ultimately succumbing to the same pitfalls as Vanguard. So with Pantheon, he opted to try something he had never done before by primarily crowdfunding the project on Kickstarter. Over the next four months, the team put together some lore and concept art and used the Unity engine with pre-made Unity Store art assets to record some short demo clips for the Kickstarter campaign. Because Vision Realm still had almost no money at this point, the team was working out of raw passion and without a paycheck. In his blog, Brad described the team's contingency plans depending on how much funding they acquired from the Kickstarter campaign. The Kickstarter goal was set at $800,000, which, according to the plan, would allow them to at least get an office space, pay for full-time developers, and then create an actual prototype that could be used to continue crowdfunding from their own website. The idea was that this would then attract investors and publishers to secure the rest of the funding they needed. If the Kickstarter was successful according to this plan, they predicted they could potentially launch as early as 2017. Well, the campaign began in January 2014, but at the end of the 30 days, pledges fell short, raising a little over $460,000 from over 3,100 different backers. And according to Kickstarter's terms, because the campaign didn't meet its minimum goal, Visionary Realms did not receive any of that money. Critics of the campaign mainly noted the lack of actual gameplay information. The team said they had originally hoped to use a more community-centric approach and leverage the feedback from Kickstarter backers to flesh out their design ideas and make a game their audience wanted. So really, all the team had done thus far was come up with ideas and design philosophies such as open world exploration, tactical and cooperative combat, and high risk, high reward decisions. They still had no money and no game. Brad acknowledged that while he knew a lot about MMOs, he nor anyone else on the team at the time knew much about how to effectively market a Kickstarter campaign, and admitted they probably announced it too early. However, he also noted that the fact that over 3,000 people were already willing to pledge to little more than an idea indicated that there would in fact be enough of an audience for this type of game to pursue it further. So, the team immediately launched their own website, PantheonROTF.com, and began their own crowdfunding efforts from scratch. However, only two months later, in April 2014, Brad announced that progress would need to be halted, since the team had still not been properly paid yet, so before long, nearly every single person left the project to pursue other ventures. 
Many people assumed that the Fallen could not rise, and the Pantheon project would just fizzle out there. But Brad McQuaid was nothing if not persistent, and one month later, in April 2014, he began recruiting friends and acquaintances to try to push the project forward once again on a volunteer basis. Still using nothing but pre-made Unity Store assets, they managed to put together a rough proof of concept for a couple zones to be shown in demo videos like these in an attempt to secure funding that could be used to take the project to the next level. But with a small volunteer team and a shoestring budget, it was difficult to make any sort of meaningful progress. Many people associate Brad McQuaid's name with big AAA studio productions like EverQuest and Vanguard. And and while that reputation drew more attention to Pantheon, it was, at this point, a hobbyist project by all definitions. Despite the fancy titles that team members were given, very few people on the outside were impressed. For example, this is a piece of quote-unquote official concept art that was released during this time. You could say it was a lack of funding that prevented the project from gaining any real traction, and you'd be right. But ultimately, one of the main reasons it struggled to gain any real funding was its lack of organized business leadership. Brad said his strengths were in developing the game itself, not running an entire company. So at the end of 2014 into 2015, the team underwent a major shakeup. Chris Rowan, the former GM of international business development at Sony in Tokyo, who helped launch the PlayStation 1, and also a longtime friend of Brad, now became the CEO of Vision Realms to manage the company as a whole. He then recruited Tim Sullivan, a veteran financial expert, as the chief financial officer to get the company's finances under control. Chris Perkins, who had been hired as a composer, was promoted to creative director since, according to Brad, he had demonstrated an extremely detailed vision for Pantheon that aligned with Brad's overarching goals as the chief creative officer. Soon after, Justin Gerhardt was brought on as the lead writer to hone the game's allure, and several other positions changed hands as well. With this fresh slate of new leadership, they decided to also get a fresh slate of a new game. It was evident that what the team had previously come up with was just not catching on, so throughout early 2015, 80-90% to of the game's design was scrapped. While the game and core design philosophies Brad had laid out remained the same, this team, under the new creative direction of Chris Perkins, spent the next several months overhauling the game's maps, systems, races, classes, etc. into a more refined direction. As he explained, quote, I was asked by Brad to sit down with Pantheon's high-level design doc, The Vision, in 2015 and imbue my ideas into it. It essentially became a co-vision at that point, and is where climates, atmospheres, artifacts, the perception system, dispositions, mastery, and climbing became part of Pantheon's vision. Since then, I've been working directly on how these things would actually manifest into gameplay, working on the actual design of the game, end quote. The concept of worlds colliding to form the planet Terminus was maintained in the lore, but other than that, almost all other details in the lore were also reimagined to fit this new design. Because creating custom art would be too slow and expensive for their tight budget, the decision was made to continue to use Unity Store art assets prominently, because, quote, this allows the world builders to lay out intricate and challenging dungeons without having to create art assets themselves or wait for a 3D modeler to create them, end quote. The team deemed it necessary to quickly and easily playtest the mechanics in the game world itself, which would also give them something to showcase to fans and investors to secure much needed funding. According to Brad's blog, the plan was to revisit the art once they could afford to replace the Unity Store assets with homemade assets in quote, the last year or so of development, end quote. Remember this, because it'll be important later. But anyway, this is when early development began on the Pantheon that we know today. And it seemed to resonate with investors, because in September 2015, it was announced that Vision Realms had acquired seed funding from a private investor for the first time. The developers were now able to be paid, though instead of working at a central physical office, almost all of them would continue to work remotely from around the world. This investment also allowed the team to launch an official company website, visionarearms.com, as well as relaunch the game's website, now called PantheonMMO.com. 
This momentum carried the team to March 2016, when they streamed live gameplay of Pantheon on Twitch for the very first time. It was pretty well received, with over 8,000 people tuning in over the 90 minute broadcast. Throughout the rest of that year, they gradually continued to bring more of their designs into the game and broadcast a couple of hours of gameplay on Twitch every 3-6 to six months. Starting in December 2016, Co Carnage, a fan of the game and popular Twitch streamer, began inviting the developers to stream their gameplay updates on his channel, which brought awareness for the game to a much wider audience. These streams seem to further increase investor and backer confidence because in April 2017, Visionary Realms announced that they had reached Series A funding. Quote, Series A funding allows the company to expand the team in almost every department and bring the game into a semi-private pre-alpha state where external testers and focus groups can begin sampling the game. End quote. In October 2017, at TwitchCon, Visionary Realms announced that pre-alpha testing would begin before the end of the year. It did in December, and pre-alpha tests continued well into the following year, with hundreds of VIP backers at the time, providing feedback and bug reports. In April 2018, Brad McQuaid appeared as a guest on a panel at PAX East about community interaction in MMORPGs. In that panel, he slipped in an impromptu comment that Pantheon it should be an alpha towards the end of the year. He quickly clarified on Twitter that the emphasis was on should, and the game would only enter alpha when it's ready. Well, in August 2018, Vision Realms announced that they had officially, quote, restructured their approach to bring the game, quote, closer to launch quality in art and polish, end quote, before it could be considered ready for alpha. While probably nobody fully realized it at the time, in hindsight, this may have been for the better because it prevented thousands of alpha testers from being on board a train that was about to go off the rails. By the end of 2018, Visionary Realms began working on what they called Project Fairthale, with the goal of quote, bringing together the full Pantheon experience with all the systems, animations, models, sounds, and effects one would expect to see in a modern game, end quote. This would in theory be used to pitch the game more effectively to investors and publishers, as well as serve as a more polished launch pad for Alpha. But it was later revealed that around the middle of 2019, partway through Project Fairthale, the team ran into a roadblock. Even though they had created some custom tools and art assets, their heavy reliance on hard coding and pre-made Unity Store assets had caught up to them and backed them into a corner. As creative director Chris Perkins later put it, quote, when the majority of your game world is built using a smattering of different art assets from different authors, with different rendering pipelines, poly budgets, art styles, etc., you end up with a world that cannot be woven together system-wise to be a performant game, end quote. In simpler terms, while Pantheon may have appeared to be nearing completion from the outside, the foundation below was not built to last. The game had reached its breaking point and required major surgery if it was to move forward. All of Pantheon's lore, design plans, and in-house art would remain the same since they had already been fleshed out, but the code and placeholder art assets needed to be overhauled to properly support a full-scale MMO. Chris Perkins later commented, quote, The game was woefully broken with no real way out. We were headed straight for Vanguard 2.0. We did what we had to do to not repeat history, end quote. In October 2019, it was announced that Daniel Krenn, the lead programmer, had left the company and was replaced by Kyle Olsen, a specialist with 15 years of experience in the Unity engine. He dug into Pantheon's codebase and started devising a plan to rebuild it from the ground up. But things would get worse before they got better. A short time later, Brad McQuaid tragically passed away at the age of 50 on November 18th, 2019. Visionary Realms released a statement saying, quote, While we are deeply shaken and saddened, we are also unified in the design, direction, tenets, and goals of Pantheon Rise of the Fallen as development advances. Visionary Realms is even more resolved to complete the vision he set out to create, end quote. This was a dark time for Pantheon's team and community, but by channeling what can only be described as Brad's relentless determination, the project pressed forward.
While Brad was perhaps most known for holding the title of Chief Creative Officer, he was also a producer responsible for overseeing Pantheon's development process, timelines, etc. His death left a gap in the Vision Realms hierarchy at a critical time. In January 2020, Chris Perkins, who as you'll remember has been the creative director since 2015, now stepped into the additional role of creative and programming producer, which means he quote, manages the overall development effort by identifying priorities, establishing production milestones, and directing the daily programming and creative tasks to meet those deliveries, end quote. And with that, he gave the green light to refactor Pantheon. The team's three programmers, under the guidance of their new lead programmer, Kyle, began restructuring the code base for long-term sustainability and replaced Unity Store art assets with flexible gray boxing and custom assets. Jimmy Lane, who became the senior environment artist in 2019, later acquired a license for Houdini and began using it to rapidly transform those new gray box zones into procedurally polished terrain. In September 2020, pre-alpha testers were brought back in to provide feedback and bug reports for the new build. By the end of that year, in just a 12-month time frame, they had completely transformed their broken game into a playable game with the core systems in place, thus reaching a goal they had previously never been able to. The developers dubbed this new version the Evaluation Build, for the purpose of allowing investors and publishers to experience Pantheon firsthand in a holistic way. In other words, for the first time, Vision Realms can actually show, rather than mostly tell, what Pantheon is really about. And even better, it actually runs smoothly and is fully scalable. These things, of course, should make it a lot easier for the devs to negotiate the funding they'll need for the game to reach its fullest potential. And so far, it seems to be working. In January 2021, Vision Realms announced that they had received a seven-figure private investment. While they clarified that this doesn't constitute full funding, they did say, quote, the studio plans to use the funds to continue the game's development and begin preparations to support over 8,000 players already signed up for an alpha release of the game, end quote. Project producer Ben Dean took this opportunity to reaffirm Vision Realm's commitment to acquiring crucial investments while still preserving the original vision for Pantheon. Quote, We've said it before and we'll say it again. We have turned down offers that would have provided us full funding but required us to give up creative control. We're not interested in selling out like that. We are all in this to make the game we have been wanting for decades. So no, we will always be in control of the decisions. It is the entire point behind the company and the game. Add to that every single one of our investors has the same values. We simply do not partner when it is not a fit. We won't give up those core principles." End quote. In March 2021, Vision Realms took the step of publicly sharing their alpha to-do list for the first time, suggesting that now, with their higher caliber tools and talent, as well as the additional funding, they finally have a viable way to get the game truly ready for the next phase and beyond. They further explained how they've observed that as the industry moves further away from traditional utilitarian alpha tests and more toward early access models, players' expectations for what condition an MMO and alpha should be in have increased, and how the word of mouth from those first impressions can impact a game's reputation. A lot has been building up to Pantheon's Alpha, and it will no doubt be rightfully met with many critical eyes, both from hands-on testers and from viewers watching from a distance. Vision Realm sees an opportunity to capitalize on that attention to get the momentum boost they need, because while they've come a long way from their humble beginnings, there's still quite a bit left to be done. Toward the end of 2020, Ben Dean explained their contingency plans for how to get from here to launch day. Quote, we are currently prepared to launch the game with the current velocity of crowdfunding. In that scenario, it means a much longer development cycle and launching without all the features, graphic fidelity, and content we would like, but it is spec'd out and planned. In the ideal situation, which is what we aim for, funding increases whether by investment, partner deals, or an increase in crowdfunding, and then a bigger, fuller game launches much sooner. The only doomsday scenario is if crowdfunding stops, and we have no reason to believe that will happen as long as we are able to earn it by showing our progress." End quote. The aim to accelerate funding might explain why Vision Realms has gone to such lengths to ensure Alpha is a resounding success. So when the day does finally come, and it's opened up to the many people who have been anxiously waiting, Pantheon can put its best foot forward.
I hope you learned something from all of this. If you've been following the game for a while, you may be able to think of some details, both good and bad, that I didn't include. But for the sake of being concise, I decided to stick to the main events that have shaped the development path of Pantheon. Hopefully that makes it easier to get a better perspective as to how far the project has come and the ups and downs that have occurred along the way. Making a full-scale MMORPG is one of the hardest things you can do in game development. Even big AAA studios often struggle with it. So the fact that Vision Realms has started from scratch, fueled primarily by public crowdfunding, made mistakes, and is still moving forward is kind of miraculous in a way. In that sense, it seems like Rise of the Fallen couldn't be a more accurate name. And remember, if you don't want to miss out on any of Pantheon's development moving forward, hit the subscribe button now because that's exactly what we do here. So until my next video, stay curious and adventure on.